Well, hello and happy Wellness Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of the IDCA Wellness for Tech podcast, where we focus on empowering current and emerging technology and cyber leaders and those inspired by technology to lead well from within. My name is Jyoti Dugar, the chaos guru. And as you all know, I have been a C-suite leader for many, many years, and having been in the uh, industry for decades, I understand all too well how chaotic and stressful and high pressure the technology field can be. So it's all the more important to lead well from within so you can harness the power of chaos and lead uh, others as well. Today, I'm honored to have our very special guest, Rob Wood, with us, a former red teamer turned CISO. Rob, Rob Wood has anchored his career in deeply technical environments and has recently co-founded a nonprofit called The Soft Side of Cyber. Here, he is helping cybersecurity professionals at all levels to bolster the soft skills they need to make a bigger impact in their role. I am so grateful to have Rob on this podcast episode today. Welcome, Rob. We are thrilled to have you. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. All right. Well, let's jump right in. I'm sure the viewers and uh, are would love to hear uh, how internal wellness from a mind, body, and energy perspective um, factors into uh, our internal selves, which then uh, produce our external environments, uh, especially the technology field. So let's start with our first question. Uh, in your role and roles that you've played, uh, over the course of your career, how have you fostered and empowered staff to prioritize their wellness over all else? For myself, <clears throat> it's been a little bit of a winding journey. I have definitely gone on more unhealthy stints throughout my career, whether that's, uh, you know, getting swept up in stressful scenarios, um, working too hard, um, you know, all of that stuff, like never saying no to anything, overbooking myself, all that jazz. And I'm, so I'm always trying things out to kind of find the right balance of responsiveness and investment in what I'm doing and taking care of myself. And so, for example, on my phone, I am a big proponent of sort of phone digital hygiene and so like i have notifications turned on on like two things um my wife is like the only person who can like call me and get through <laughs> it doesn't go to voicemail um and and my father-in-law um and like i i you know i, I have screen time sets for um you know a, a whole bunch of apps and, and stuff like that so i don't get like sucked into doing stuff um it's so easy to get distracted. I do a lot of time blocking with my schedule to try to make sure that I, you know, get time to exercise, all that jazz, read, um, journal. And one thing, you know, I, I also try to do a lot of like walking meetings and, and stuff like that outside. Um, nice. That is just, you know, it, well, I don't like sitting in front of a laptop all day. It drives me nuts, especially in my current role where there's a ton of meetings. It's just, I don't know. It's depressing just sitting there, like watching your watching your inbox grow or trying to respond to emails while you're mm -hmm. while you're, uh, you know, in a meeting. It's like I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> so I don't. I get outside and I put my AirPods in and then and I just go for a walk and have the meeting and it's so much better. Um, and then you know, I I also, um, yeah, I try to you watch what you eat. You kind of experiment with what's going to work well for you. Like I went totally vegan for like a year and a half i'm definitely not um on that on that kick right now i did recently stop drinking coffee which wow. like, i found myself i was like getting really ag agitated and you know, short-tempered and whatnot and um you know i don't want to be that way with my coworkers. i don't want to be that way with my kids or my wife and so i I started drinking this stuff called mud water instead. Yeah. And it's I like, heard of that. oh my God, it's like, it's got like kind of a chai taste to it, but yeah. it is. Like, Does I it taste had, good? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really not bad. Like you gotta, you gotta blend it well. Um, yeah. But I, I drink it ice and I, I mean, I literally have not had a desire for coffee since drinking it. And I used to drink like six cups a day. Oh, um, wow. Like full pot and iced coffee, like, I love 
I love coffee. That is a lot. So did you say you got irritated with coffee or when you stopped coffee? With coffee. With coffee. Okay. Yeah. I think it was just, you know, I probably wasn't sleeping as well, all that. And yeah. And I've, it's been great ever since. Um, Wow. And yeah. So endorsement for the mud water. Um, They don't pay me for it, but uh, (laughs) it's amazing. Um, And it has built in caffeine in the mud water. No, so it's yeah. it's like um it's nootropic uh mushroom blends. Um okay. Okay. and so it's like seven different kinds of uh uh nootropic mushrooms and yeah, it's just like this like the blend of them gives is is intended to give you like the alertness and all of that without the crash and and whatnot. Like I never got jitters, I never nothing like that, but I just found myself really like craving it and and agitated and yeah i, I feel like oh, i'm i am always better. looking for natural uh things out there so i will definitely check mud water out yeah, i've check, heard of it, it i thought it was actual mud though that... i know it's it's weird um no it's it's uh yeah check it out let me know what you think but so as for my team though i i mean you you can't you can't obviously make decisions for people you, you try to like create space for them and So, so, I mean, I'm a big proponent of getting rid of like meetings and stuff like that that don't need to be there. I I find that, I find that especially in bigger environments, there is a, there's a tendency to just like fill your space with, fill your calendar space with meetings and whatnot. And that, that it, it creates a, an environment where people feel like they're tethered to their, so their stuff constantly, and then they have to work after hours to do stuff. And so, I mean, if you like create big meeting blocks or time blocks, like no meeting Fridays and stuff like that, then people can actually do their thing and they don't feel like they have to do it after hours. Um, You know, you hold people accountable. Like if they're taking a flex day or a day off and you see them join a meeting, like get all over them and kick them out and (laughs) until go like take their day off. And... That is great coming from a, the leader of the organization, because I think oh, yeah. the leader sets the example. So if you're sending emails during vacation time, then you're kind of setting that precedent. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Well, that's emails. the other thing. Exactly. It's like you set the example you want to see your your team follow. And like when I first joined my current role, there were people who like they would constantly be working on their flex days and all of that. And like and that's not like, no, get out of here. Like you're intending to take the day off. Like, go take the day off. Um you want to text me, text me. Like we're going to talk about something not work related and that's <laughs> fine. Um, and yeah, yeah. So, so it's really like, you know, I, I feel like my job as a leader with respect to self-care and, and wellness and stuff is really just like try to create an environment where you don't get raked over the coals or like held out to dry if you're taking care of yourself. And, you know, somebody wants to take a day off, like unless it, because there's very few situations where there's real emergencies. They exist, but you can't treat everything like it's an emergency. Right. And there's so much like just frantic, you know, an almost annoying um yeah. <laughs> uh sort of um like perspective that people bring where it's like, oh, this little project that I'm working on or even this big project like it's it's so critical, it's so important. It's, you know, we got to drop everything and all of that and it just it creates this like this tension, this this um this hyperactive focus uh, sort of thing, um this anxiety almost in people who yeah. are to it, which and then that, puts you in like a fight, flight, or fear mode uh, all the time. Yeah, exactly, and that's not that's not healthy. And so, so just chilling out and creating space to chill out, like I I think you end up getting more out of your people, out of your teams when you do that. And yeah, so I'm a big advocate for all that, all that stuff. That's interesting. You you made uh, this conversation is making me remember this uh, analogy. This this is not mine, but when I heard it, it really uh, struck me uh, um, and it kept it in my mind where they talk about NASCAR drivers, um, like fastest people in the world, but they pause, you know, whatever, every few laps <clears throat> just to kind of refuel and re-energize themselves, make sure everything's okay for you know at least a few moments. And then they kind of go even faster or, or more effective in, you know, the, the, the last few rounds. I'm like, well, if they can kind of pause, you know, in the middle of a race, 
just to just to do that i think all of us need to kind of take a moment you know throughout the day just to just to pause and it'll be even more effective and efficient after that um Absolutely. you know versus the mentality now is like oh no no if we pause now we're wasting time spending it on ourselves instead of the work which is you know uh, well, the opposite. i mean even so like i i am a i am a i'm a fan of um you know take people like david goggins or whatever who are just like you know these savages who just are like they work really really hard and they're 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 just hustlers but even even in those cases you've got like when they're advocating for like a rest day they're not advocating that you're just like laying on the couch like a sloth like they're advocating for like you know you should continue to be active and be disciplined and all of that but also take care of yourself and like one of the if you like read his book all the way through like if you if you read it up until the last chapter but not the last chapter you're like oh my god this guy is this guy's insane then you read the last chapter and then he's uh it's all about like how he was like on his deathbed effectively because he had like pushed himself so hard and but he never like took time to like stretch and kind of like recover and once he started getting super intentional about that his like he went from like his body basically being crippled to then being like stronger than ever and now he's like back yeah. on the ultra circuit and all that jazz and and I feel like there's a, um, yeah, there's a, there's a natural like rest rhythm built into so much, you know, if you're, if you're, um, you know, religious, you've got, um, you know, you've got the Sabbath, you've got, you know, if you're, you're just practicing more like just mindfulness techniques and all of that, you've got things like meditation, like big banks will like force people to take vacation time. Like, yeah there's a rhythm of rest built into, you know, even like farming and stuff like that. Like, you know, the, things don't happen. Like soil needs to rest. Like everything needs to right, rest. Right. Like you don't see people milking cows like in the middle of the night just to get more milk. Cause that's oh, when yeah, you, the milk quality would be really low. Exactly. <laughs> um, you, 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 yeah. you rest and then you go and then you go back and go hard. Um, and, and that's just how, yeah, that's just how it's gotta be. <laughs> There is an actual Ayurvedic, uh, it's called the Ayurvedic clock. And Ayurveda is like a 5,000 old ancient um, medicine practice in India. The thing is, they're, they claim to be like, it's like the oldest uh, form of medicine that existed. It's all natural based. And so there's a certain clock that, you know, there's certain times of the day that's best for uh, uh, like mental work. There's certain times of the day that's been like, that's meant for like physical type of work, um, okay. you know, and, and certain times for sleep habits. And then based on your body type um, in general, they, they remain the same, but based on your body type, it, it, it could fluctuate a little bit. Like if you're a Vata body type, then yeah, you shouldn't work past 10 um, because <laughs> you, you really want to kind of sleep uh, at 10 o'clock. Cause if you don't, and he's, you, you know, you're a night owl, you're going to start like your second round and I think by midnight and that's just going to keep yeah. you up all night. And now you're kind of screwed up your whole, you know, rhythm. Um, cool. Will you yeah. send, send me a link to something, uh, something yeah. about that after. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I mean, there's I'll, even I'll times to act, to ask for, I mean, they say ask for money, but you know, if you're asking for a budget or you're giving some sort of yeah, yeah. something related to money, like don't apply for jobs, like from this time to this, this time, you know, so yeah. oh, I <laughs> love know. it. It's, it's hard to keep track of sometimes because it's like, oh, well, the deadline is uh, 10, um, but I won't get to my computer until like 9.50. But if I go past 10, does that mean I won't get this job, though? <laughs> you sure, know? Sure. So, you know, you can't take it too. But it's good to just Literally. have a framework in mind and know yeah, you how to do a rhythm. Yeah. And there's like colors of the day, colors of the, yeah, colors of the day that um, are based on the, the planets, uh, like each planet has a certain color and each day of the week um corresponds to a certain planet so if you wear those colors it just adds like to your to your energy um and if you don't if you wear like the opposite color let's say white is represents sunday and then you end up wearing black on a sunday it it just it's right. just one more factor that's just going to lower your, your energy naturally sure. um, so, so tell me, tell us about a uh, little bit more about the soft side of cyber. So what does that mean? Um, and I know a lot of your blogs and on your website, there is a lot of wellness that you focus for, for your, um, from that side of things and also emotional EQ and things like that. So how did you get yeah. into starting some, something like that? Cause that's very rare in the cyber industry. Totally. So 
I have worked in a lot of different environments throughout my career. And I've worked with some really brilliant people who can't talk their way out of a wet paper bag. Like, yeah, for example, in the, in the world of consulting, like you've got that, you've got that, that neck beard of a engineer who, you know, you don't want to ever put him in front of a customer or you, you don't want him writing report him or her writing reports or, you know, whatever, because that's just not their thing. Right. And you want them doing the deep research and, and all of that. And that's, that's like their happy place. Right. And, and I've worked with, I've worked with people who are just jerks. A lot of people in the security industry are just abrasive and hostile and we shame users and all of that stuff. And that's just so not helpful. Um, and there has been, I've seen leaders who are super effective, super just amazing at what they do. And it has just kind of dawned on me over time that you can be as technical as you want to be, but if you're, if you are going to be effective, you need to be bringing that technical, that technical uh, background, packaging it, framing it with something else. You need to be able to communicate effectively. You need to be able to think critically. You need to be able to take care of yourself. You need to be able to build coalitions because a lot of security work happens through other teams, not by the security team. Right. You're, you know, a FANG company and you've got security engineering teams and stuff like that, but <clears throat> that is not the norm. And even in those cases, they're, those teams are working through IT and other platform engineering and all of that. And so right. you've got to be able to do the the people work. And <clears throat> I have not seen any dedicated resources to developing soft skills for people in, in this field that I so very much love. And, and so I wanted to put something back out there. And I actually originally started it as uh as a different blog, I started under another name called Hack Your Cyber Career. And <laughs> I like I was doing it solo and I had a slightly different take, but it was it was basically to say I I like wove in some technical elements. I did like weekly challenges and stuff like that. Cause Sands did this thing way back in the day of like spot the volume in code snippets. And I was like, oh that's so cool. I want to like replicate that. Right. But I just, like I was doing it solo. And I ran out of juice, couldn't keep it up. And I was also having a kid. I was moving, I was, you know, all these things. And um, and so it went on pause, went on the back burner. And then I co-founded it, like picked it back up recently with a good friend of mine, Frank Demizio. And we like relaunched this thing as a soft side of cyber, new logo, new, new site, new content, new all the all the things. And yeah, our mission was really just how do we help cybersecurity people, whether they're entry level, pen testers, SOC analysts, incident responders, compliance people, auditors, leaders, how do we help them develop these soft skills to get better at what they do? Because if you're, if you're, you know, if our industry is fighting with one hand behind its back, basically, because we're all technical, you yeah. know, you get a black hat, you get trained, every single course is technical. Right we're not going to be as effective as we could be. And I mean, you read the headlines and all of that are you know, like the times demand that we in cybersecurity be more effective to protect ourselves against all this crazy stuff that's happening and right. protect the organizations that we're working with and all that. And so like, so yeah, I just wanted to like pour back into this space and, yeah, so, so that's what we're doing. Especially leaders, because I think a lot of um, yeah. cybersecurity leaders did not take a course on <clears throat> cybersecurity leadership. Uh, I mean, although there are, th thankfully, there are a couple of great courses out there now and programs that you can take. Um, but yeah. before, like nothing like that existed. So we were all technical at some point, And then, you know, we just kind of got moved up in the ranks or yep. they didn't have anyone. And they're like, oh, these this person's already in cyber. Let's just make them a manager. Um, right. They're good at what they do. And yeah. And there's a lot of people that end up in that situation where they've never done people management before or led a team. And 
Like I, I found myself in that. So I came from, I came out of consulting. I was a principal at Sigital and then I, I joined a startup and I was the first security hire. And so, you know, you're doing engineering work, you're doing compliance prep, and I've never built a budget, built a strategic plan, hired anybody, fired anybody, any of that. And right. there was no playbook for it for me. I was just figuring it out. And, and then I did it at two more startups and I've since been asked and like sought out by so many of my like friends or former colleagues or people who are, they're trying to make the jump from technical IC into management and they don't know what to do, or they just recently got the nod and like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like help me out. And yeah. And, and so there's really not a lot out there for people, but even, even like yeah. you've got like leaders and managers by title, and then you've got your, your really, you know, take that really senior penetration tester or that really seen, you know, the person who like is running the sock floor or something right. and, you know, or like writing incident updates, even, you know, critical incident happens and they need to, they need to write an update to senior leadership. Like right. how do you write with impact without using jargon and, and keep it, keep it brief. Yeah, that is so that's, difficult. That's a skill. I mean, I've even had vendors struggle with that. <clears throat> you know, they, they're presenting to executive leadership and, you know, I have them practice with me first. I'm like, okay, if, if it's, you know, if, if it's not, if you can't get to the point in like the first two minutes, you know, you're going to lose everybody else. Cause I at least have, yeah. you know, came okay. from cyber. So I know what you're talking about, but then I'm going to pretend like I don't, <laughs> you know, just so I can prepare you for the rest of leadership. Cause they're definitely not going to understand. Um, Absolutely. And, and it's not even a question of, well, if we don't fix these vulnerabilities, then we're going to, you know, uh, it's going to be bad. And like, well, why do I care? about fixing vulnerabilities like how is that going to impact the organization um are we going to end up in the front page of the washington post because of this one vulnerability or is there something else that's going to happen you know just you kind of yep. put like the bottom line up and yep. i have found it a challenging but also i've found it challenging when if you've hired someone for their technical and tactical experience um and and they're a leader in that space. And then you're trying to empower them to be more of a holistic leader uh, from a strategy and soft skills perspective. It, I found that to be very challenging because, you know, you, you, you hire them for a very specific reason and trying to train them into a different space altogether um, is, is not as easy as I, as I thought it would be, you know, because yeah. you can't really send them to a school or, a teaching program and say, oh, you know, you got to really learn how to speak effectively and and think strategically. Like it's not just about tactical. Like let's solve those and let's solve that and let's solve this um, yep. approach. Well, and and I feel like there's a there's a tendency too for security people to get really wrapped up in the fact that what we do is important and thinking that it's the most important thing. And I mean, I, I've also worked, I've been in this position where I've over, overdone it on security and like just pushed for things that were unreasonable and, and got in my way. Um, and, and it turned out to be a totally bad decision, uh, or yeah. like misguided decision where yeah. I, I feel like opting for more simplicity, something that was more operationally simple to maintain, you know, stuff like that would right. have served us better. Um, but there, I mean, there's a story circulating around on LinkedIn a couple of months ago about a, I think it was Datadog. They they went down for a period of time after they fixed some some vulnerability, mm -hmm. and it was something that, and I I don't want to misquote it too much or bungle the 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 details too much, but like I, I recall that they after the, after they did like a post-mortem and such that it did, turns out they really didn't need to fix that vulnerability and it actually introduced a huge operational risk because mm -hmm. things went down things broke and and it was yeah. hard to it was hard to recover from and, and all of that it, it was like this really sort of weird kubernetes um uh sort of configuration thing right. uh, or it was like a race condition and and with that in mind it's like how often do cybersecurity people like how often are we considering the 
the other elements of the organizations that we're in and where we stack up in a particular context. Right. You know, whether it's the budget time, whether it's schedules, like getting, you know, getting a product to like go to market, like, is it faster to, or is it better to go to market with something that's a little less secure, but like, you're going to be first to first to play and like have a huge market advantage, like first mover advantage right. at your organization. Yeah, it, it might be, <laughs> it might be yeah. more advantageous to do yeah. that. And we, we yeah. just, we're not really trained. It's not really reinforced in us through our culture and our conferences and our, our lingo and our talk and our peers to think that way. And I think a lot of times uh, cyber professionals forget that availability is one of the the three. Uh, Absolutely. You know, and, but that kind of often gets on the, the sidelines. So if you have that's an the last one, that's like yeah. oh, availability. OK, you know, <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a trope, too. It's like, oh, if you want something secure, like unplug it from the wall, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I've heard so many people sort of run with that joke and. Yeah. Yeah, and that's obviously not feasible for organizations. Right. To function. Like, that's, that's great if it's like a gadget at home, and you know you have multiple gadgets that you don't really need. <laughs> sure, exactly. just like one of them, you know, exactly. <laughs> that can make a difference, but not an organization. So let's talk about let's switch over to you know more of your your uh, your personal experiences. Um, has there been any experiences in your life that have shaped you uh, and, and who you are today? And has there been any times where you felt maybe a bit awakened to a new reality or changed the way you do things in life from it? Yeah. So I've had a few a few moments of pro pro one of the most significant ones is about a year and a half ago i i mean i've i've kind of been on this journey for a while like all right i'm going to i'm going to tell two stories first one was i i was getting out of college and i had landed an intro or sort of like an entry level consulting uh job in this little rinky dink shop up in Syracuse New York and I'm super grateful to them. They gave me a shot. And I learned everything I could from them. And <clears throat> they, like, I was just pouring everything that I had into that, into that job and like this lifestyle I was trying to build. And because I, I came from a, like my family and all of that, I came from just a very different environment. Like I was not really encouraged to do any of this stuff. And I was kind of, charting my own path, so to speak. Mm. And I was so wildly unhealthy, super overweight. And at one point I had gone on a trip and came back and I was uh, dating this, this girl, this woman, um, and came back. Uh, turns out, uh, she was, she was being unfaithful. So I had a whole life crisis un unfold, uh, around me. And, and so, we ended up splitting up and I decided like, I need to get, I, I need to get away from Syracuse and um, from upstate New York. And so I like made a plan to like quit my job, all that. And I moved down here into the Washington Metro area. I moved to Sterling, Virginia. Oh, okay. and that's when I entered Sigital and I like sort of flipped my life around, like, you know, different kind of work, you know, same like similar security but like way different kind of environment learning from different kind of people like basically i was coming in i had zero software security experience and that's all they did mm -hmm. um <laughs> you got i was gonna say I, what was the interview like <laughs> intimidating <Okay. laughs> extremely intimidating they had me whiteboarding like padding oracle attacks um and i that I have I've never worked in an environment like Sigital and I'm still just blown away by what that culture was and everything that they built. And I I continue to stay to be friends with a lot of people who I worked with there because they were just they're amazing. Um and but I like, you know, I sort of turned my life around with respect to like investing in my like waking up at a certain time every day, working out, eating healthy um reading again because i gotten away from reading all that stuff 
And so turned my life all around. Uh Um, Another major point in time, like, you know, you sort of settle into these rhythms in life, like, you know, work and family and house and all this stuff. And um, about a year and a half ago, probably close, closer to two years now, um, my my wife and I were really we were struggling. We were going through a ton of stress, like there was kids stress, house stress, work stress, money stress, all the things. And um, like we were just going through a crazy difficult time in our life. And um, her mom was in the middle of a, a fight with cancer and was passing away. It was like just all around not good. And um, and so at the like also in the middle of this we were going to a we were attending a church and it turned out one of the one of the people at that church a pastor was uh was like a like a sexual predator and um he was trying to prey on a bunch of people in the congregation uh successfully in many cases and just like manipulating husbands and wives. Oh, pray pray as in P R E Y pray. P R E Y. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Not the good kind. Yeah. Um and <laughs> just totally manipulating his his role and the frame that he had about himself. And wow. it turns out so he ended up getting a getting into a lethal car accident two days after my wife's mother had passed. And he was like, you know, trying to he was basically trying like he was trying to prey on her. Um, and while like that, none of that like ended up playing out, but it was like this kind of wake up call of sorts of like, like that she was in a really vulnerable place. I was not really there because of my own like stuff that was going on. And it was just like, yeah, you know, and, and I had like drifted into unhealthy habits again. Like I was drinking a lot more, um, all that jazz. And it's like, Um, again, like I was not taking care of myself. And so I started, um, I, like, I started sort of unpacking all that, like, uh, started going to therapy regularly and sort of investing in myself, started journaling, started, um, you know, really getting serious about like exercise and healthy eating again and, and sleep. And that, that's when I did the coffee thing, um, uh, around, around that time. And, wow. uh, well, shortly after, yeah, a after, little bit after all that, as I was kind of hacking my you know, what was going to work best for me, but right. like, yeah, cause like, you know, you, you don't invest in yourself and it can come back to bite you in all these parts of your, what was that? Um, all these parts of your, uh, your life, your, your relationships, yeah. your, your health, your work, and all these things are like inner intertwined. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and those, those were just like two experiences that, you know, were symptoms of a really unhealthy me at the time. And, and it wasn't until I sort of like had to look it in the face that I was able to kind of come to the reconciliation that I, you know, I need to do something about it and either go and start getting help. Like I, you know, I had never, opened up with people even like some of my best friends like had more open vulnerable conversations with them yeah never did it like i was you know very cold sort of uh short like you know kept kept a lot of things surface level and you know i made a very conscious effort to like just be way more open with people and and it's been one of the most rewarding experiences i could possibly like site like you know both my wife um friends all of that and you know you realize like you can't do everything you can't like you can't carry the world on your shoulders without it crushing you yeah yeah and if we're internalizing everything then that's that's gonna just that's gonna manifest into a physical body issue as well like a dis-ease or some sort of ailment because you haven't really processed anything oh yeah like there's this book um it's it gets to be pretty technical but uh it's called the body keeps the score if you ever read it and, i have heard of it i haven't uh, read it strongly recommend that you check it out they have an audiobook version of it <clears throat> um but it's all about like these it's more like psychological sort of stressors and stuff and what that does to your body like right. you're like the fact that you're like like the the tldr is 
stressors in your life, both good or bad, cause these like permanent changes in your in your 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 neural pathways and all of that, like the, these yeah. these things that happen in your brain. And um, but at the same time, if you're if you're investing in yourself, the brain and the psyche and the body are incredibly amenable and and um you know like you can shape them and and adapt past it and and get to a place where you're back on track but yeah yeah there's actually a program that i think i did uh, i did i'm always doing different programs and trying to learn and you know i feel, I feel like if, if you if I ever get to a point where i feel like oh i've learned enough like i know everything then that means that there's something wrong <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. all for help over here no, if, you're, if you're not learning you're uh like yeah, you are you are in a dangerous place when you think you know everything yes. about. Yeah. So you reminded me of two different things. One is there's a, a there's a doctor called uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, um, who's really famous. Uh, and he's a I think a neuroscientist, um, some sort of neurological doctor. But he ha had a very he had a similar incident where he had a really bad car accident um, and he was put in a coma or he was in a coma and then he, they were about to amputate his legs. And right. something about like while he was in the coma, he started visualizing himself walking again. Um, and by the time he got out of the coma, they were basically about to do some surgeries to amputate his legs. And he's like, can, can I just try to just get up from the wheelchair? And they just, you know, kind of laughed at him like, well, OK, you can try. But, you know, it's not going to happen like your legs don't work. So we need to get this, you know, get them amputated. And I think by the second day, like he actually was able to get up. And I think within like two months or so, he was able to walk. And then now, you know, so all through like visualization in, in his mind of, of the future, not think about the past or the current situation. And he now he's really famous. He does all of these workshops and there's like thousands and thousands of people. I think NIH does done a lot of research because there's like 20,000 people that attend his his workshops. So it's a great case study and um, and people have been known to just go to his workshops and some people uh, got their eyesight back. Some people started walking again. Um, amazing things all naturally, not, you know, no surgeries or medications or anything like that. Um, That's amazing. And I think what I think is it was like rewire your brain. It's something about I think rewiring your brain to become the self that you want to be versus yeah. what you are now. And you can basically heal it, like all, all of that naturally. Oh, it's yeah. It no, it's incredible what what is actually like how the body actually all sort of uh, comes together and connects yeah. and whatnot. It it's. I, I mean, I am constantly blown away when I like read stories like that or, you know, all yeah. all the things yeah. like it's amazing. A lot of it is just believing that that it's possible, you know, not not having a closed minded perspective like, well, that's I impossible. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so talking about that. um, So I know you, you've you've had a, a couple uh you know, awakening moments in your life when you started a lot of uh, better habits for yourself. Are there any morning rituals or any rituals you follow in your day now that you found to be helpful for yourself? So the mud water is definitely up there. I, so I just recently moved like 10 days ago ish. Oh, wow. And so my morning routines have been disrupted a little bit, but I used to get up and I would read um, I, I had four of these, like sort of, you know, those like daily reads. Um, and so I'd like read a page out of each of those, like, you know, the day of the, um, like whatever day it, it was, um, I would do a little bit of, um, a little bit of reading out of, um, out of the Bible. I, I am a, I'm a Christian and I, a little bit of reading of like whatever other book that I'm doing and some journaling and stuff. And that, that was kind of like my, that was like my anchoring place of, you know, didn't I like not, not an excessive amount of time, like yeah, 30 to 45 minutes maybe. Mm -hmm. And just like sort of get my headspace right. And what I, what I really like, I feel like what I need to be doing is, you know, making sure that I'm carving out like the exercise time and stuff in the morning. Cause I, like that really worked for me. 
uh, when I was doing it. And I find myself in a, in a place where, yeah, I'm like staying up doing stuff and it's just, you know, I got, I got two young kids, like they'll wake us up in the middle of the night and, you know, I just, I just don't wake up super duper early anymore. Um, right. When I do and I can work out, that's great, but I'm not as like, you know, I don't have uh, the, the set rhythms that I would ideally like to have. Yeah, that's that's interesting to mention kids and find being able to find the time to work out. Uh, I have three of my own. They're they're now six, nine, and twelve. But sometimes I feel like okay, well, I can only exercise in the days that I don't have them because they go with their dad every other week and they're with me every other week. And uh, so initially, it's like okay, well, the week that I have them, there's no time for exercise. Um, until I started figuring out like, well. They're six, nine, and twelve. They don't really need to be babysitted. <laughs> you know, they they you know they can take care of themselves for uh, you know 20, 30 minutes. Um, and I'll, I kind of thought about like how do I involve them in my exercise, even if they don't want to do what I'm doing, but they can do something else, and just make it like a family time to do something physical. So uh, like yesterday, like, well, we want to go take a walk in the neighborhood, mom. I'm like, okay, sure, you guys do your walk, and I'm gonna do some sort of like, I'm going to bring my weights, <laughs> you know, yep. and then walk with you guys, but I'm going to do something else. And then it just ended up like, oh, I don't really, oh, I can, I can actually do this in the presence of my kids or while we're cooking dinner. Now they, they help too, which is great. Um, so let's throw some music on, let's get some dancing in, you know, while we're waiting for the pasta to cook or something, we don't just have to sit there waiting or watch TV. I'm like, nope, no TV. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's just have fun with it. And while we're moving um, as well. So I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it, as you start finding ways to incorporate what you want to, um, there, there's always ways to kind of incorporate it in. Um, and, and not, and giving yourself a lot of grace and, and not pressure to like, okay, well, I have to do this and I have to, I have to do that. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I definitely have, I don't, I don't beat up on myself like that anymore. It's more that like, I know I'm a better person when I do it. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, e even if like, like my boys love stories and stuff. So like, you know, they'll, they'll kind of um like watch a disney movie or whatever and and sort of enjoy themselves and like if they're you know sort of enjoying that or or like playing a game or whatever like i'll go try to sneak in a you know 15 20 minute like workout yeah. um yeah and sometimes you need the break for yourself like if, especially if they're in a state of chaos which is gonna uh, be my next question like are there any wellness hacks that you've developed for yourself while you're in a state of chaos, whether it's at work or whether it's, you know, with your family or kids. Um, because one thing that I've noticed is, you know, I used to do a lot of these meditation, yoga classes, all, all kinds of different wellness techniques. And those required you to either travel somewhere or find a place in your home, dedicate 45 minutes, get in your zone. But then you re-enter a state of chaos again. Well, you know, uh, when you have to go back to work or or you have to deal with your kids. I'm like, okay, this isn't really working because I feel great for that 45 minutes. But how do I, you know, uh, take that energy with me while I'm in a yeah. state of chaos? So for me, I've developed just uh, like minute portions of it. Okay, I don't have to do a 45 minute meditation. What if I just do a one minute meditation or do a breathing exercise or while I'm incorporate things while while I'm already doing things that I was already going to do like brushing my teeth um mm -hmm. so instead of brushing my teeth and thinking of all the things I have to do today like why don't I just brush my teeth and just feel my feet on the floor um focus on the act of brushing your teeth like something that doesn't really involve your brain um so I'm curious as to if you've developed anything because I know you're in a state of chaos a lot from being in cyber and technology yep yeah i mean i'm 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 a big fan of like the little bits of stuff here and there like that's that's why i do like the walks and stuff um even though it's not quiet time and whatnot but you know i, I can kind of get into a place that is just you know it's it's healthier to be moving and be outside and not be on your butt in front of a screen like and so right. it's yeah little little bits of stuff here and there um and that also seems to work really well for me like 
uh, you know, drink a lot of water or all that jazz. You know, just like taking time to like be intentional about certain like self care things is super helpful. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Rob. Uh, will you please tell the audience where they can find you if they would like to reach out to you? Yeah. So I'm at I'm on LinkedIn uh, primarily. I probably have profiles elsewhere, but I don't actually look at them. Um, I'm on LinkedIn at the uh, find it Holy Cyber Batman, sort of a play on the Adam West uh, Adam West series, and. I'm uh, I do a, most of my writing on the soft side of cyber.com um, or just soft side of cyber.com, not the and, you know, periodically I'll, I'll post elsewhere. But that is my that's my that's my bread and butter. All right. And any last words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our community before we close today? Do not let the pressures of tech and work and all of that stuff make you think that taking care of yourself is not important because like <clears throat> yeah it's just like you will be a better you you can't pour from an empty cup so you will be a better you if you just invest in yourself well amen to that well, that's a wrap, folks. Thank you so much for listening today. We'll have uh, links for to Rob on the podcast page, as well as all of his information. And see you all the next third Wednesday of the month to focus on your wellness and leading your life from within.